right, uh, well, welcome to the very last session of the day on a Friday, right before the weekend, of course. So I'm glad there's so many people still with us. Um, and it's 425, so let's get started. For all the speakers, I'll um, let you know when you have five minutes left uh, for, your, for your time. And uh, then I'll also give you uh, a one minute warning too, so you could um, wrap up. So our first speaker is Pravya Nayak, and I hope I still said the name, your name correctly. Uh, and this, she's from Hitachi Ventara Federal. Thank you, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Mike. Uh, hi, hello everyone. This is Pragya here from um, Chief Data Scientist with Hitachi Ventara Federal. Um, it's been an awesome day with so many interesting uh, uh, data science and statistical programming use cases. It's amazing. Um, so um, one thing is when I start working with my, um, any example or problem involving data science, the first question that pops is, is uh, what all are the data that is available and uh, what is not available. So that becomes important. And a data catalog helps me in that pursuit. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a brief introduction or rather a lot of text there, but I'll just make it quick. Uh, um, I got introduced to machine learning and statistics as part of my PhD program at George Mason University and it involved applying machine learning to estimate the distances of galaxies. And from then on, it's been a um, awesome journey in my data science space. Next slide, please. So anytime we look at a data um, related problem, there's definitely the first question that we should pose ourselves is, why am I doing it? Um, the reason we do that is because we're trying to get to at some decisions um, in a smart manner based on certain intelligence, based on certain data that is available so that we can take certain actions and thus forms the space of actionable analytics. Next, please. And the overall goal is operational efficiency and data monetization or a combination of that, depending on whether we are in the public sector or the private sector. Next, please. And that, the decision-making process um, is best outlined in using one of the techniques of where you, you identify what is the vision and mission of your task and accordingly narrow it down or broaden it as you may want to look at it into specific goals and objectives. And these goals and objectives will have certain strategies and tactics tied to it so that you, in order in the long term, you want to be able to meet your vision and mission. And there'll be certain action items coming from it. Next, please. And these are all tied together and they have an interdependency associated with it. Next, please. Where are we going? Next, <laughs> you can skip to the next slide, please. And these tactical goals and strategic goals, the difference between them is the tactical goals are where you're trying to keep a pulse on the present. You are trying to get a closer view and one of the outcomes from that is you want out notifications, alerts to be issued so that you take necessary immediate action and fix and take the corrective course. Well, the strategic goals, goals are more long-term. They typically, they are more long-term. They have, there are emerging trends and patterns that you want to be aware of in order to make sure that you, you are in the right path to meeting your strategic goals and you're moving ahead in the right direction. This is, Strategic goals are more generalist and it's, you want to have a more wide screen view where there's a dashboard. So as you can see, there's a difference between the tactical and strategic goals. Next, please. In addition to this, um, why you would want to do uh, data science and uh, um, feel the need for a dat data catalog eventually is because there are certain regulations also in place, um, which are inspiring us to go more in a data-driven direction. Um, the federal data strategy is one of them. In addition to that, there's the Foundation for Evidence-Based Policy Making, the GREAT Act, the Geospatial Data Act. Uh, these were all hinted at, at during the uh, keynote this morning as well. Uh, so these are some of the reasons why data-driven cultures are becoming more important and the data catalogs help us in that direction. Next slide, please. 
this is just mentioning the other uh, acts that I mentioned earlier on and how they um, push us in the direction of open data. And open is actually an acronym. It stands for open, public, electronic, and necessary, saying that data is available, made available for public use in a machine readable format so that more automation can be implemented on that. There are a couple of other interesting data sites that I have mentioned there. Uh, if you're not already aware of them, definitely recommend you to check them out. Uh, next slide, please. Next one, please. And so all this leads us in the direction of the different types of data analytics that you want to do with your data. So, and we have seen a large number of very interesting use cases in the presentations that have gone ahead with prior to present one. And uh, they were in the different spaces of uh, either they were doing diagnostic analytics, looking at patterns and trends that based on what has happened, keeping track of prior information or taking the data that has been collected and figuring, coming up with a predictive analytics around it or prescriptive analytics around it. So as you can see, there are these different reasons why you would want to know what are the data that I have access to or uh, that I don't have access to and I need to find it. And even going deeper into the data itself. Next, please. So this le leads to a data ops methodology, which is a culture in which uh, the, uh, the three main trifecta of people, process, and technology are stressed on. There is a interdependency between these three things so that any data operations that are happening is uh, and that is repeatable is being automated as well as there is a continuous improvement in the whole data life cycle so that um, anytime there is new data it is affecting the the different applications downstream which depend on this data that is being happening in a continuous manner whereas if there is any uh, opportunity for improvement that's also being taken into account and all these in turn enable ai and ml applications so one of the components of the data ops methodology is the data catalog um, next slide please so enterprises do struggle to get value from their data as you have come to realize. Um, finding the right data is hard. Um, then governing and securing sensitive data is hard because if, if that is difficult. That's the reason often the data is locked down. It's like, no, we, we don't want to release it to anyone. But if there is an effective mechanism by which your data can be selectively made available um, so that based on whoever has an actual need for the data, you're granting access to them. And based on if I need it, I should be able to request access to the data. So the mechanism around that, that's another thing which a data catalog can make possible. Preventing data clutter again is hard. One is where you can't find the right data just because you don't know where it is located. Other is where you have so much data that it Literally your volume of data is the reason that you are no longer getting value from your data because you can't figure out what, what am I actually looking for and where can I find it? Next slide, please. So analysts typically spend 62% of their time looking for data. Uh, which is uh, sad because they could spend that much amount of time on focusing on solving the problem rather than looking for data. Next slide, please. Next, please. So we can see that there is an operational gap that happens between the language which is used by the technical team versus the business users and the data stewards. So in technical terms, it could be saying that it's a database table. What is the connection to the database? Which table has it? Which particular column in the database has it? Whereas as a business user, I'm more interested in knowing what is my invoice number? I don't want to be struggling with figuring out where, where is the database actually connected, finding out the driver for it, and then connecting and look, formulating my query for it. How can that be made more simpler? And similarly, data stewards who deal with the data governance part of the data framework, they have a different need from this whole, um, from all the data that is available in your organization. So the operational gap is what makes it more manual, error prone, and um, not tenable beyond certain critical data elements. Next slide, please. So, the advantage is that a data catalog and that to a AI driven enterprise data catalog provides us, the data can be automatically tagged with business terms based on what the system has seen 
prior, it can use that to learn and recommend for future data items that it sees. If you throw a new table at it, it should be able to look at the different columns of the data at it, and based on what it has seen in the past, it should be able to give you a recommendation. And this recommendation should not necessarily be restricted to by the name of the column, but based on various other characteristics. Like the specific product that I use, that has about more than 100 attributes it maintains for a given column of a database. So that based on that, in future when it sees something similar, it's able to make a better prediction on what it's what is likely that column holding, what information is it holding. So the accuracy improves. And since it's automated, you can work with a larger size um, data asset, data set, data collection that you have. Next, please. And these, as you can imagine, as your data is more refined, your data is more easily accessible, more federated, um, democratized, all these are different terms, which literally means that your data is more accessible for the data consumers to be able to do more specialized problems utilizing your data rather than spending time looking for the data itself. So these are all these data governance projects, data self-service projects, and uh, um, any type of data lake migration projects as well. Next, please. So, so this leads to your crowdsourced curation. So the discovery and tagging of your data becomes, gets improved. Collaboration is much better, as well as your number of use cases which your users can handle now increases because they have access to all the data or most of the data that is available in your organization and be able to do better use cases around it. Uh, next, please. So there is an AI-driven discovery and tagging which is happening. So as I mentioned, there are 100 plus features maintained for a given attribute of your data and that is used to classify and tag and keep on continuously improving on that suggestion. And then as an end user, when I see a particular tag being applied for my given database column, I can go and say, no, I do not agree to this, change it. So this is one type of information or feedback which is getting back to the AI engine and it uses that to improve the prediction in, in, the, in the newer columns it sees in future. And similarly, if I say, yes, this is right, that is another information which is used. And this whole collaboration process where we are all providing the feedback to the system, as well as if I have questions and I know individual X is an expert in a particular data asset, that type of collaboration and discussion is also useful to be tracked in the data catalog. So that's another type of information which is useful. Uh, next, please. So this is a uh, more of a high level framework uh, where uh, how the different uh, data analytics applications can be layered so that it shows you the different types of data sources that one can potentially connect to, get the data, do the necessary transformation. Um, once you have identified what you are looking for based on your search in the data catalog, you could pull it in into your other analytics applications and thereby get to the different solutions you're trying to uh, implement and uh, get a better grasp back. Uh, next, please. So the data catalog is an enabler for multiple things in your data science pipeline. Uh, the specific product that we support, it's, the name is Limara Data Catalog. It's a data self-service platform that utilizes machine learning, as I mentioned for the AI tagging, as well as uh, um, a couple of other similar f um, features like that. So that uh, you have more uh, informed, um, you are more informed in terms of what data is there and what are the characteristics of the data. And the, um, the outcome of this type of information being collected and managed by that application is that, that as an end user, I'm able to get into the application and say, I'm searching for, let's say I'm a marketing analyst and I'm looking for marketing campaign data. So it's more of like a Google page for my data sets. And I would just go into my, um, my search screen within that application and say, find me all the marketing data. And it would give me all the data based on the different characteristics, different attributes have that have been identified for the various data sets. It gives me a faceted search based uh, uh, like any shopping portal 
it's like your shopping portal for your data that is available in your organization. And then you can get into the detailed information on each and every uh, data set that you look up. You can refine it down to what exactly you're looking for and then be, start doing a deeper dive into the specific data set that is of interest for you. Like as you can see in the second screenshot over here down below, uh, for a given uh, data set, we can get more information on what are other related data sets that other people have looked at. What are the characteristics? Is there any sort of documentation available for it? What is the sensitivity and the accuracy associated with the data? Things of that nature. How many columns are there? What is the size of this data set? Those, you have easier access to that information in a more user-friendly manner than having to get into the database and perform queries in order to figure that information. Oh, Pratya, Next slide. Pratya, I'm sorry, you have about four minutes left. Sure, thank you. Next slide, please. And there are a lot of other features. That was a very simplistic view of saying that it's a shopping portal for data sets. Yes, it is, but it lets you do a lot more with your data. Uh, then you can start probing into your respective columns and figure out what is the distribution of the data? Uh, what is the tagging that has been done? So the um, I keep move, trying to move my mouse here, sorry about that. Uh, so in the upper screenshot, as you see, there, there is the, um, there's the, the pink colored items, those are the tags, and there's certain other uh, colored items as well. So the, those, there's a distinction between the different coloring and the uh, uh, format which has been used for them just to represent the different categories of tagging. One is where it's based on uh, certain basic, basic type of tagging, like saying it's a day um, attribute or is a date attribute or is it a um, social security number attribute, things of that nature. But then it gets even more specific um, as it has learned over the usage of the system. It's uh, based on that knowledge, it starts recommending you other types of tagging as well. Um, and since it is not just restricted to the name it is seeing in, in the data set you are investigating, it's much more uh, um, smarter uh, than uh, just being based on the name. And a couple of other additional information, a short, uh, small sample of what are the possible values. One other neat feature of having a data catalog is you want to, you get access to your lineage information. And uh, what lineage means is where, um, where I'm, I, um, as a data set, where am I getting all the different attributes that are part of me, as well as who else am I contributing to? Where is information being used from my different columns and being reused in certain other data sets? So that type of uh, flow of information from uh, one data set to the other, that is visible to you via your lineage information. Now there are various different types of lineage information which can be tracked. Uh, um, what uh, this product does is it tries to figure it out based on how the data was formulated and that's the information which is shown to you in this uh, uh, in kind of a graphical format in the screenshot below. Then there is a sensitive data disk. You can tag your data as sensitive, which is one of uh, a prime need in most of our federal government work experiences and role-based access control. So you can determine uh, your groups of users who should have access to a certain subset of data sets versus uh, another group of users who need to have access to another set of subsets. So those type of role-based access control is also one of the features. Next slide. You, you, you just have one minute left. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see, a data catalog um, helps you move from, um, lets you get more, um, you're trying to solve data problems and you want to find the data that will help you address your problem and then you can focus on your problem. So the data catalog in turn enables you and it in turn uses machine learning to be do a better job at automating the whole uh, data exploration and the data curation process. Um, this is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I would love to have any type of data discussions with you anytime. Uh, thank you so much and have a great conference. Thank you so much, Pragya. I appreciate that. Um, and let's see, our next speaker, I guess if you have any questions for uh, Pragya, you could ask in the chat. We don't have time to, to answer them right now. 
But our, our next speaker is um, Tom Niano from uh, RTI International. And Tom, I don't know if you heard, but I'll um, let, give you a five minute warning and a one minute warning. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here. And can you, do you mind confirming that you can see my PowerPoint slides here? I can see them, yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so hi, I'm Tom Yano um, from RTI International. I'm a data scientist there. And today I'm gonna be presenting a project called Automated Revenue Prediction Modeling. Um, the purpose of this talk is to share the system infrastructure that um, we came up with for this project. Um, and that's the primary purpose. Um, and I'll get into a few details, but given the length of the talk, I'm just gonna be focusing on that uh, architecture. So uh, first off, I just wanna thank, uh, you know, thank all my team members and acknowledge them. So anyone who's watching this presentation is just aware of the fact that there's been at least two dozen folks who have worked on this project. Um, so it's really taken a lot of effort um, and a strong collaboration between um, our finance subject matter experts um, developers in our IT department and data scientists at RTI International. Um, and that's how we were able to build something successful. Um, and I, there's no way we could do it um, otherwise. So just, just to lay out the agenda here, first I'll describe the problem definition. Then I will describe the solution that we came up with. Then I'll very briefly describe the machine learning layers that gave rise to that solution. Then I will go into the system flow. I'll talk about the data integration piece, um, the method for development to deployment, our automated training, and then a summary of all the resources that went into building out that infrastructure. Then finally, I'll end with just a, a few conclusions about uh, the system architecture and, and some things learned along the way. So first off, um, you know, why, why did we decide to build a revenue prediction modeling system? Well, annually, our financial analysts, analysts create budgets for the upcoming three fiscal years. The first fiscal year budget that the, they create is very regulated and detailed. And the second and third fiscal year uh, budgets that they create are less detailed um, and they're more high level assessments. And there are some limitations with this. First off, uh, it's time consuming. It takes about three months to build these budgets. It takes a team of financial analysts to build it, which means that their methods for creating those budgets uh, can vary. And the, the detail view is constrained just to the first fiscal year. And then finally, it's expert knowledge driven. So the methodology for creating these budgets is really, it, it's reserved to those financial analysts which is also a strength because, you know, they're the experts in this, in this space. But what we wanted to do was to take that and try and automate a, a big piece of that. So our goal was to use historical and current project financial data to create an automated system that foreca forecasts some of our most important financial metrics like revenue over the next several years. So some key features of this would include automated daily updates, forecast models created using machine learning, multi-year forecasts, a user-friendly interface and reports. And the benefits of this would be a longer perspective, a longer financial perspective. Um, it would be adaptive to data. So as projects change, the forecast would change. The methodology would be codified. So if there are any questions, you could you know, would know exactly where to look to determine how it was built. Um, and it would be a tool that would assist the financial analysts rather than replace what they were doing so that they could make more informed um, decisions as they were building reports. So just to describe the machine learning layers, we have uh, five different models that we use. Um, the first is built in R and it, the goal of this model is to predict dollars won from opportunities or awards. Then the output of this goes into a second model which predicts revenue um, for opportunities and current projects. Then this predicted revenue goes into a third model which predicts the spread of that revenue over time. Then that spread of a revenue goes into a subsequent model, which is actually a series of models. Um, and this predicts the project income and spreads that over time. Then finally, we have a, a fifth model, which is, is not a true machine learning model. It's more of, of a weighted average, set of weighted averages, um, but it estimates missing future opportunities and it also spreads those over time. 
So to then get into the system here, um, first let's start with the data. So we have a couple different databases that we draw from. The first is our project accounting database. We also have our opportunity tracking database. So again, these are, these are projects that um, we're considering um, trying to get and, and going after. We take these two databases and we um, merge them into a data warehouse and then begins um, a series of pieces that are all built in Azure. Um, so first we have a, a, we use the Azure Data Factory to schedule uh, pools of the, of the data into a data lake. And then that data lake, the data in the data lake goes into um, what's called Azure Blob Storage. And Azure Blob Storage is really the entry point for everything else in the system. It's the entry point for the developers to do their work. And it's the entry point for the system when it's reading files and processing those files to read from. So then once we get to the, to, once we have the data set up, uh, developers are able to pull this data in and to start pre writing pre-processing scripts, training their models, um, and writing the evaluation scripts or, and the, uh, the scoring scripts. Um, we take the, all that code that gets written locally and we push that up into a feature branch. Uh, the feature branch is the primary location where if a developer is writing something new, uh, that's either a, a feature or a bug fix, um, it goes into a feature branch. Then once the feature branch is complete, uh, someone reviews it, and once that gets approved, that goes into a pull request, which um, goes into a pull request to go into our development branch. The development branch is the primary branch um, that things go through. And once a, a merge into the development branch is complete, it triggers what's called a build. And in Azure, builds are in a resource called Azure Pipelines. In the build step, this is where um, tests against the code get executed uh, as part of the CI CD process to make sure that we didn't accidentally introduce any new bugs and that the code is still robust with the new changes that we have. Um, once it goes through this build process, um, all of our code is wrapped up in Docker containers. So the Docker files that are in our repositories are the instructions for building Docker images that are built in this build step. Once the build step has completed, it writes those Docker images into a, a container registry which holds those images that have been successfully built. Um, and the container registry where those are written have a set that are written for um, our development branch. Once the build is complete, that kicks off uh, the next pipeline step, which is a release step. Uh, the release step runs the image that just got built and proves that the container runs as expected. As it does that, it, it's also reading data from Azure Blob Storage. Again, we have a, a separate uh, development section for the data that is being read in the, in the development uh, context. Once the once the run is complete and successful, then uh, it updates a script that is on our, our VM that is responsible for running the containers every day. It also uh, updates it with a tag so that it can read from the container registry to get the newest uh, image that was successfully built. Then after it runs it, it uh, generates output in our uh, web dashboard which is the entry point for users um, to interact with this data. So one other step that, that I didn't mention that um, is, is a step that's also after this, this build step right here is what's called the artifact step. So for some, process, for some pieces of the pipeline uh, in these repositories, uh, there are steps where an, what's called an artifact gets built. So, uh, we have four different Python repositories. And one of those Python repositories is actually a, a Python package. And it's, it's the backbone to all of our other modeling uh, repositories that use Python. And in order to be able to read the, that, repo, the, that Python package into the Docker files, we have to create an artifact for that. So this is when that gets built, that, this is where that gets stored. So after the entire development process um, is, gets successfully deployed, our financial anal analysts test the outputs. Um, they make sure everything looks right. And then once we hear that everything looks right, then they give us the go ahead to then um, merge that into production. 
So we take our development branch and we create a pull request to merge that into production. And then once again, it, it follows the exact same process that um, was the process for the, the development build process. So it goes into a build, that build, it runs a bunch of tests, then it builds the Docker image, then that image goes into the container registry here. Then once the build has successfully completed, it triggers a release. The, uh, in some cases, the release will update the bash script on the, um, the VM that's running the Docker containers. And um, again, throughout that, while it's doing that release process, it's reading from blob storage. Um, and then again, it also has that, that step where it might build, uh, it might write an artifact to Azure artifacts. So the, the process for the development pipeline and the production pipeline are identical. We, have a, we just start off with our development pipeline first so that we can make sure everything flows through correctly. We can then test it and then we can release onto a production branch um, with, without problems, ideally. Uh, so one extra piece is that we have a schedule in our, our build pipelines for training builds. So for each of our models that go through training, which are M1 through M4, we have a schedule that schedules off a build so that it will automatically run training and then just run through all of these things. So the, this whole flow can get triggered by a pull request into um, development branch or production branch, or it can get triggered by a quarterly schedule. Uh, and then again, finally, our, our financial users or our business decision makers who are using this tool, their entry point is the, a website. So they, have, they see the production website and they have access to a, a dashboard with all sorts of financial metrics um, that have been forecasted over the next several years. And then they can do filtering um, and they can also generate uh, Excel reports that they can use um, for you know, whatever they need to use it for. So now let me get into a little bit more details about uh, the train and score pipelines. Uh, so first, uh, I'm just going to, I'll describe it as the, as the flow is for automated training. So to begin automated training, we have a build pipeline that creates the train container. So this is triggered by a development into the production or merge branches. And when it gets triggered, it launches a Docker build. So during that process, it's building the Docker container or Docker image. And then once that is complete, it sends that image to the uh, container registry. Uh, once that's successfully complete, that then triggers another build, which is the automated train build. So during the, in the automated train build, uh, that launches the, the actual Docker container that just got created and now it actually runs the training. The training includes pre-processing the data, um, training the models, and then evaluating the models. Uh, it, once this is complete, it then writes the, the, the model artifacts, which can include any um, intermediate pre-processing data or other artifact data or the models themselves and evaluation uh, to Azure Blob Storage, which we treat as a, a model registry. Then it takes the timestamp for that entire process, along with other statuses, like whether or not the job was successful, whether or not the evaluation was successful based on different uh, evaluation criteria. And then it will send that to another build, which is then um, what we call the automated training publish pointer. Uh, the publish pointer, its goal is to basically just log the timestamp for that process for a given model. And then it also logs uh, the, the status variables that we, that we just mentioned. So like whether or not the job was successful. Uh, and this is how we keep track of which model to use at score time um, after a, a train process. So once the train publish pointer has been, has been published, uh, then this kicks off a, uh, a score container, a build to do a score container. It creates the Docker container that's used at scoring or at inference time. And then once again, um, once that gets completed, it goes to a container registry and it kicks off a release process where it runs the container. If it makes sure it, makes sure it works correctly, if it works correctly, then it updates a bash script on the VM. Um, and then that 
is what's used on a daily basis until the whole process gets kicked off again. So just to summarize all of these different resources, which, you know, if you are interested in this, you can come back to this and look at this just to have an idea of which each piece does. Uh, we use Azure repos for holding all of our code. So that includes data processing, modeling, tests, pipeline configurations, and Docker files. We use blob storage as our inputs and outputs for that modeling pipeline. We use the con container registry to hold uh, our Docker images. We use Azure pipelines for building, which can perform um, continuous integration, continuous development tests. It builds Docker images, it publishes artifacts, it runs the actual training containers, and then uh, release pipelines, which update uh, scripts on the VM with up-to-date tags. Uh, and then we also use the Azure artifacts for storing our, our Python package, as well as other model artifact uh, pointers. Hey, Tom. Yep. Oh, you have five minutes left, but I okay. see you're on conclusion, so that's. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so just to wrap it up, um, you know, this was, this was, building all of this was quite a learning process. So um, I just wanted to share, uh, you know, some of the highest uh, things that I took away from it. Um, so first off, uh, if any of you are familiar with Azure um, and, and the different resources that are available, you may be asking, well, why didn't you use, why didn't you use the Azure Machine Learning Cloud environment, um, which allows you to track, it has um, version uh, control auditing, um, and it, it really it does seem like a, a good use case. Um, however, the reason that we didn't go with that was we just found it would be faster to implement in our case, doing it the way that we implemented it. Um, so that actually could be a, a good option and I'd be interested in trying it out sometime. Um, it's just not the way that we did it. Um, also the way we did it, um, you know, it, it's all very containerized. So in some ways it's, it, some of it is um, platform agnostic, um, which I like, um, but I think that the MLOps uh, machine learning cloud environment actually supports Docker images. So it may still be usable. Another key takeaway was that uh, Azure does provide good Python support. Uh, but sometimes the documentation can be inconsistent, uh, which, which can be a little bit frustrating. Um, whereas the R support is much more limited and getting R working in production um, has been more challenging. We've been able to do it, uh, but inevitably things that, are, are, that come easier to Python and Azure tend to be more difficult um, on R. Uh, so that's it. Um, thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions with the couple minutes that I have left. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we have, let's see, about three minutes left for questions. Uh, I think we're asking for questions to be entered into the chat. Um, I can't see the chat. Let's yeah, see. well, I, I can hopefully see the chat. <laughs> okay, yeah. Please read them out loud to me when you get a chance. Sure. I don't see any yet. Although I, I guess I'll have since nobody's asking a question, I'll, I'll ask one. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little bit more about R in production in terms of, um, I don't know, recommendations or well, best so, practices? Um, I'm not as experienced with R in production. Um, so, so I can just say what, what we've done. Um, again, we containerize everything using Docker. Um, there are other, you know, tools you can use for containerization, um, but we find it works well. And so we have our, our, our scripts, um, and again, what's actually being run is that, that container. Um, what this does is it allows us to have a bit more control over that R environment. Um, and that's actually true for, for Python and any other language that you're running in a container as well. Um, we, one of the things that we've done, I believe is we, one of the issues we had was um, reconciling version changes for libraries in R. Um, so, you know, let's say we build this thing and then in a couple of years, one of the libraries changes, um, which affects different dependencies. Um, that's one piece that we had to deal with. Um, so we have, a, we have stored some of those libraries so that if they become deprecated, um, we can, we, we will still have that, um, which makes it, we'll, make it easier to update if we have to. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. So um, I think we can then go to our next speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, appreciate thank it. Thank you, yep. Um, okay, so our next speaker is um, Keegan Rice uh, from Nork at the University of Chicago. Hey everybody, um, can you hear me, see me, and see my uh, slides, my titles? Yes, all of the above. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really happy to be here. So I'm from Nork at the University of Chicago, and I'm going to talk a little bit about computational reproducibility and focus on R. And actually, Tom just gave almost uh, the most perfect segue possible, um, because I'm going to be talking about package um, changes over time and package libraries and all that fun stuff. So thank you for that uh, wonderful transition. <laughs> So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, NORC at the University of Chicago is an objective and nonpartisan research institution that delivers reliable data and rigorous analysis to guide critical programmatic business and policy decisions. So um, I'm actually relatively new to NORC. Um, so my, this work was partially funded by the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Evidence, also known as CSAFE. Um, and it was advised by my graduate advisors, Dr. Heike Hoffman and Dr. Ulrika Genschel. So this is part of my graduate research. I just finished and then um, joined NORC. So um, just a little bit of background. So when we think about data analysis pipelines, a lot of times we're thinking about a modularized linear pipeline of sequential decisions, right? So we have some data, some input, and we have a series of decisions or actions that are being applied to that data. So a lot of those actions or those decisions that we're applying to data are um, utilize underlying code. So um, we might have some input, we might go through some data processing steps and data wrangling, all that kind of stuff. Um, we might have some feature creation or variable selection or transformation, all these types of things. We might have some statistical modeling or you know, apply a machine learning algorithm of some type, and we have a quantitative output, right? So this is a really general overview of what a data analysis process might look like. Um, so the question for computational reproducibility is, can that pipeline and the results at the end be reproduced? So we're gonna talk a little bit about what computational reproducibility is in general. So there's sort of two big facets I like to think about and talk about. So the first is literate programming and reporting. And what that is, is the idea of self-contained documents that contain the code that are generating the results and figures inside the output, right? So this really gets to the transparency of the methodology. If there's a paper published or we're publishing some results from something, um, this would help us be really transparent about what exactly we're doing, what actions were applied to our data, and how we generated our figures and results and tables. Then the other side of things is the numerical reproducibility of results. So this um, really gets at the code used to generate our results and whether we can reproduce our results across users and machines or over time. Um, so this, you're gonna see in a minute, we're gonna talk a lot about our package changes over time. Um, so this, this part focuses on the consistency of the methodology. So literate programming, things like our markdown and, and knitter and, and all that kind of stuff, um, really get at the transparency. And then now we wanna think about the, the consistency. So can we reproduce this over time? So we can think about this, this little pipeline setup we have here. If something in our code that we're applying changes, you know, maybe in step one or step two or anywhere, how does that affect what our output is going to be? So um, I'm assuming most people are familiar with R, but just to really quickly touch base on this, um, the R language model, which is very similar to the Python language model, has a sort of base structure that gives data structures, ob object manipulation and function syntax and kind of defines those things and includes a few packages um, that have been really added over time as they've been sort of accepted as like really part of base R. Um, and then most of, a lot of what we're using is user developed packages on top of that. Now, this is a lot of data science and data analysis capabilities and they're subject to change over time because they are user developed. So for versioning of those packages, there is CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, um, which does have some review process and, and that gives us a little bit of static views of a package over time. But um, 
The one thing about it is that users must install and update packages themselves. So this means that versions could be different and most likely are different um, between users and across machines or over time things will change. So what does that mean for reproducing analyses in R? So it means that a lot of us will get headaches trying to reproduce analyses in R. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some existing approaches that exist um, to help with computational reproducibility in R and then talk about what we've done to kind of come up with our own solution. So the there's some package versioning packages that are really interesting. So there's one, um, Tom, this might be useful for, for you and your team, um, Checkpoint, which stores versions of the CRAN mirror from every single day. And you can essentially insert a checkpoint into your R scripts. And um, if you've got the checkpoint package installed, you can insert a checkpoint that's, you know, use packages at this date. And then anyone who runs that script, it will use the packages that date. I have not used this to a large extent, so I'm not sure about the functionality, but it is something that it, um, provides a really interesting approach to comp computational reproducibility. Um, then RStudio has put out a couple of approaches as well, um, the first being Packrat, which sort of creates a private package library uh, at the R project level. So this is if you have an R project going, you can create a private package library specific to that project. Um, and then their, their newer approach to this is RN for REN. I don't know how to pronounce this one. Somebody correct me if, if they know the correct way. Um, and from what I understand, it's meant to be a more robust replacement for Packrat. Um, I know Packrat had, had some issues in terms of usability and functionality. Um, and so this is similar to Checkpoint, that it sort of stores a package snapshot that can be restored if packages are updated and um, that there's then an issue, you can restore a previous snapshot. Um, there are some other really interesting packages such as PackageNet that uh, that one lets you visualize the network of package dependencies and also a network of function dependencies inside a package. And then Drake, um, which was developed as part of our OpenSci, primarily by Will Landau. Um, that's a really interesting one as well. Um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail just, just for the sake of time, but if you're concerned about computational reproducibility, I highly recommend you check out some of these packages. There's some really awesome approaches. Um, so the one thing is that a lot of these approaches, um, save for Drake, uh, emphasize static reproducibility. So the goal is sort of to capture a package version at a static point in time and say, we're going to use this version. Um, we're always going to use this version. This is what it looks like. Our code works when we have this version. So what we, we have focused on is adaptive reproducibility. And, and what that means is we want to focus on identifying the changes over time, because as we've seen, R develops at a really rapid pace, especially things coming out of our studio, such as the tidyverse. Um, things are updating at a really rapid pace and we're gaining a lot more functionality and really cool tools to that we can use in R. And we want to make sure that we can maybe take advantage of those, the new functionality or speed updates if code is optimized or things like that. Um, but without breaking our code. So our approach, um, we take a two-step approach. So the first step is really similar to what's already out there, where we sort of define the scope of package dependency. And then after defining it, we maybe refine it a little bit. Uh, if, if our package dependency is, is too big, <laughs> then we maybe think about rescripting some things to, to reduce our dependencies. And this is sort of similar. We want to define the scope of the problem and essentially capture what our packages look like at a particular point in time. It does differ a little bit because we want to capture different information than a lot of these static approaches so that we can compare then with later versions or a version on somebody else's computer. The second step then is comparing. So we want to compare those inventories um, that we've taken of our packages across users, across machines, or over time. So this would help us identify specific package differences. Um, we could identify places in a script where those differences occur and then find potential issues that might arise because of package version differences really quickly and proactively. So we've, we've implemented this as part of the manager package um, by myself and Heike Hoffman, and it's currently on GitHub, it's not yet on CRAN. Um, so I'm gonna sort of talk through that, the tools and a mini case study. So consider we have a data analysis process that makes use of five different packages. So we use tidyr and stringr um, in the data wrangling phase. We might use pur to do some transformation. 
dplyr to do some reduction or filtering, and then we're going to use random forest, right? So we've got this process that only uses five packages. And kudos to you if you can do a huge process only using five packages, but just for the sake of um, for the sake of the example, we've only got five. So what we can do is take an inventory of those five packages. Um, so we can um, call our package and then we can say take an inventory and give it the list of packages we want it um, to inventory. So it captures all the package objects um, and their dependencies and then some meta information, um, the raw function text, some info about the parameters and things like that. So then what we want to do is visualize that and what it looks like. So what is our, what is the scope of our inventory? So this is what we see. If we take that project inventory and we plot it, um, you can see this top row here. Those are the five packages that we initially called that we said, you know, these are the ones I'm using. These are the ones that have a library statement at the top or require or whatever at the top of my script. But what's actually happening is those have their own dependencies. So we have this whole set of implicit dependencies that we may not be actually calling, but each of these packages um, depend on the packages below them in, in this sort of hierarchy tree, right? So we may think we're only using five packages, but our work might actually depend on code from a whole lot more packages than that. Um, and this is just a side note. Um, if you do this for the tidyverse, so if you use library tidyverse, this is how many packages you're technically <laughs> dependent on. Again, you, you may not actually be calling code from all these packages, but um, just, I just like to point this out, um, just how much is really involved in the tidyverse when, when you call it. So the second step, now that we've sort of defined, okay, we have these five dependencies, we have all these other implicit dependencies, now we wanna say, can we compare my inventory to somebody else's? Or can I compare my inventory six months from now? Can I look and see what's changed? So we wanna identify if there's practical differences, such as difference in the function code, or parameter options or defaults or things like that. So um, some details about how we do this. We use strategically placed MD5 checksums inside the inventory so that we can really quickly compare and see whether objects are identical. Um, and that just helps us do things a little faster. It's computationally faster. So what I can do is have a colleague take, um, maybe, maybe she's gonna run some, uh, an analysis for me and we wanna see if there's any major differences between our package versions. Um, so I have her take an inventory, she sends it to me, and now I'm gonna compare the two. So what we get from the compare inventory function is a text summary. So that's gonna give us a summary of everything that's different. And then some actual objects, um, a table object and an objects object, which is not the ideal name, but uh, it's, it's what I named it at the time. Um, and so essentially these are gonna give us some of that meta information and, and more detailed information about where objects differ. So the text summary looks something like this. So between my inventory and Amy's inventory, you know, we'll say the digest package has one object difference between the two inventories. Differences were identified in the following objects. And so we see that digest the function has changed. Um, and then, you know, same with dplyr. So you get the summary file gives you this whole list. Um, so looking at this comparison, just to focus on tidyr, um, we, we can see that the tidyr package has 48 object differences between our two inventories. So um, I'm really going to hone in on Nest for kind of an example of how this can be really problematic. Um, but, you know, there's a bunch of functions that some aspect of the function has changed. It doesn't mean anything drastic has necessarily changed, but we want to be able to, like, investigate that. So we're going to take a look at Nest. So let's say I have version 0.8.3 of Nest, and, and my colleague has version 1.0.0 of Nest, which is the actual <laughs> scenario when I ran these two inventories. So let's say we take the chick weight data and we nest it um, by diet. What we're gonna get in version 0.8.3 is uh, diet with the column uh, named diet. Um, we're gonna get the factor and then we're gonna get a nested data frame. Now in version 1.0.0, um, the syntax of the, the function has changed. So you're gonna get dot, 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 one for your name for that uh, column. Now anything that comes after this in your script that relies on the column name is going to be impacted, right? And so um, there are warning messages, um, you know, there's, there's a warning message in the code and there is a version, particularly for Nest, that's called Nest Legacy that you can use um, that is still the same as the old version. But if you are rerunning a script or someone's rerunning an analysis, what's gonna happen 
and I know from experience, is you're going to run something and you're, you might get something that's completely different in your plots and your tables and your charts and all things like that. Um, and I do want to note that these two versions were released only six months apart. So this actually goes back to some of the things Scott was talking about at the, um, in, in his keynote this morning, differences across people of packaged versions and libraries and all that stuff can be, can be really frustrating because things can break in a really short amount of time. Uh, Keegan, you, you have about five minutes left. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, I, I do want to emphasize that in this case, the developers from RStudio do typically publish release notes and code um, and the warning messages in code. Sorry, that's backwards there. Um, but it still can break, it, it can still break your code and your analyses and then you have to go hunting down what's wrong. Um, so the, the other thing that I want to point out is it's also very difficult to keep up with all of the release notes and all of the versions. We're all busy. We've got a lot going on. It's, it's hard to keep up with that um, without having something kind of point out those differences for you in an automated way. So uh, just to conclude, um, our package is um, really helpful because it allows you to identify changes before or while they break your code. Um, and it help, can help with changes to packages over time, or you can compare inventories you know, across users and machines, for example, I was doing some work on my personal machine and then some work on like a more production server and there were different versions, right? So I, I wanted to make sure I was gonna get the right, the same results regardless of where I ran the script. Um, you can also search scripts. Um, I didn't go over this function, but there's a function where you can search in our script for the use, for uses of the functions that have changed between two inventories. And this has been really useful for team collaboration or reproducibility over time. Um, my research team in graduate school that I was a part of, um, that we found this really useful for team collaboration because we were a lot of people contributing to package development and code development um, and changes were sort of really rampant across machines and users. Um, so some future work and improvements, um, we'd like to make the code a little more robust and more available. So by more robust and more available, we, we uh, want to submit the package to CRAN, we're, we're working on that. Um, but the other thing, which is a very ironic note, is that we want to work on our own package dependencies. So um, we need to, we're, we're working on removing some of our own dependencies on tidyverse packages. And this is because I'm sort of an R user term, turned developer rather than a developer turned R developer. <laughs> so um, then the other things are um, working around C and C++ code. These make it really difficult because the user specific address when they're compiled is different for everyone. So it's just going to say they're always different. Um, and we want to add some interactivity and additional features to the package. So I will just warn, it's, it's definitely still sort of in the baby phases, but we think the functionality that's there is really useful um, and has potential to be um, to grow a lot and, and provide a lot of really useful functionality for maintaining computational reproducibility. So that's all I've got and I will happily answer any questions anybody has. Thank you, Keegan. I think we have time for uh, at least one question, and, and you have several of them in the chat. So uh, maybe you could, um, if you can get to the chat after your talk, get uh, answer some of them. But I'll go to the first one. Um, how does this deal with version changes in R itself? With the default changes in handling of factors, would it handle the um, default changes in handling factors for that happened in R? Our version, our version four, for example. That's a fantastic question. And that's actually one of the things that, um, yeah, we, we've sort of, a lot of package changes have been sort of broken. The tidyverse and, and sort of production packages that are coming out of places like our studio can keep up with changes in R because it's all they do all the time. That's their, their whole job, their, their whole thing is, is developing these packages. Um, it's really hard for a lot of other package developers to keep up with these changes. So um, I'm not sure specifically about whether this would identify the changes in R Studio versions or R versions, um, but it does capture that information, um, what version R is and um, kind of a lot of that additional information. So it would tell you if you have a different version of R. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So I, I think we, we have one minute left. Um, somebody asked about PackRat. Uh, does PackRat from R Studio handle some of these problems? Um, so PackRat would help if you want to sort of 
keep a library, um, define a library and keep it um, essentially stored. And then, you know, when you reopen that R project, it's, it's going to be the same library. Um, but it doesn't really, it's not, there were some issues that we found with when you want to update a package or update R. Um, we found it to be a little bit difficult um, to use PackRed. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're out of time. So we'll go to our um, last speaker, but there are some other questions um, in, in the chat if you, could, if you could get to them. So our last speaker is uh, Frank Font from uh, FINRA. And Frank, I'm not sure what FINRA stands for, so hopefully you'll tell us. Absolutely. I'm here with, uh, with two of my colleagues uh, from the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And I'm going to do my best to get the presentation uh, running here. There we go. All right. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Wendy, for the introduction. I'm here with David Yanos and Yan Cheng, and we're excited to share with you our adventure of implementing a flexible R-based machine learning solution into production at the financial industry. Regulatory Authority, by the way, very fun place to work with smart people doing really cool things uh, with a good mission, which is about keeping the markets uh, fair. Now, before we dive into the solution, I want to give just a real brief, brief background on the application uh, that motivated us to go down this road. It's called Context Engine, and its purpose is to serve up meaningful smart links to the staff, uh, there are over 3,000 employees. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you are you uh, sharing your slides or? Uh... You know, I I thought I was. Thank okay. you so much, Mike. Thank you. Let's fix that. You missed all the cool slides, by the way. Now there's nothing cool. Uh, let's see. There it is. I use Zoom every day like everybody else. And of course, it's still a challenge uh, to find the right screen to share. Uh, I think I found it. There we go. Share. All righty. OK. Uh, can, you, can you see it? Yes. All right, fantastic. Thank you. All right. Application is called Context Engine, and uh, let me just give you a little flavor of what it is, uh, just real briefly, briefly here. Uh, I'm going to show a fun page. All right, so the application has a curated inventory of both internal and external applications that are meaningful to the analysts within the organization in the course of them doing their work. Um, the uh, context engine uh, makes sense of what they're doing uh, when they request links. It goes through its inventory and uh, ranks uh, potential deep links to other applications for them to click on so that they don't have to rekey information or give a lot of thought to what other application to go to or, or even new staff that may not have the institutional knowledge that their colleagues have from day one. They, they click a little icon and boom, they get a list of clickable links that are relevant to the activities that they're doing. So it helps them discover. So part of that whole experience is not only classical algorithms behind the scenes, but also machine learning uh, models that we um, are going to explain to you um, how, we, how we approached here. First, I'm going to share the problem statement, then we're going to go into the technology a bit, and hopefully we'll have some time uh, for a little bit of question and answer at the end. So a little bit about the problem statement. Uh, we decided going into this that we wanted to decouple the model development from the application development uh, for a lot of good reasons. Uh, I'll just uh, touch on just a couple here. Uh, one, so that we could progress in parallel. Uh, once we agreed on some basic uh, parameters, we could just start development of the models while development of the application was underway. Uh, 
Another uh, reason to decouple it is uh, to enable refinement and improvement uh, of either the model or the application independent of one another. As long as the contract between them is unaffected, everything's great. We also uh, set out to uh, have a solution that allowed us to deploy more than one model at a time and have them all uh, running in our various environments. We've got a development environment, we've got a QA environment, we've got a production environment. In fact, we've got a few more environments than just those. And we didn't want to be restricted to having the environments share a version of a model. We wanted to be able to iterate the versions and to simply point to the model we were interested in by updating a configuration entry rather than deploying code. The key technology that we decided to employ here are R, Plumber for infrastructure, and then Git and JSON. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Janos. Thank you, Frank. So the idea was initially, as Frank was mentioning, uh, to provide uh, some insights from statistical and machine learning models about the most interesting links for the analysts in the process of their investigations. You know, they, those are complex investigations trying to find manipulations in the stock market. So it requires to access different kinds of data sources and different applications, internal and external. But the idea was to, okay, how can we actually go ahead and navigate, uh, you know, the universe of applications and endpoints within an application, you can have several endpoints to actually point, uh, you know, the analyst to the right place. So the idea was for us to start with simple, you know, statistical and machine learning models and see how far we can go there, how satisfactory the result could be for, for the users. Uh, and the initial approach here was to use the correct package. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is because the possibility of combining multiple uh, algorithms. Last time I checked, uh, current package has, this is a classification type of problem, multi-class classification type of problem. So last time I checked, uh, current package has more than 200 different algorithms for classification uh, algorithms. Um, so it's an interesting way of standardizing the syntax of different packages that we know could be problematic from previous, uh, you know, talk, we saw some of the issues that we can run into if we don't consider, you know, a, how to actually make possible the different packages uh, talk to each other and change some results. So Caret package was the initial uh, selection that we pick here. Uh, we also use, uh, uh, as mentioned in the previous talk as well, Backrat and R Markdown for uh, reproducibility uh, purposes. Uh, and what we did based on what um, Frank was explaining is to use the configuration file to, ident to initially identify what, what, what's gonna be the structure of the data that we were gonna have. And I'm mentioning this because this is one of the few projects that I have at FINRA in which we started to train a model with actually having a date, right? The actual data that we were receiving. And this is very uncommon at FINRA because we have plenty of data. But in this particular case, we started to making sure that we have engineered the system, that we have all the plumbing required all the connections required uh, to make sure that we, uh, you know, are ready to receive uh, a significant amount of data once uh, we go live. So we did that and we trained the model with uh, synthetic data. And we start with a simple model because the, the general approach here was that, uh, let's see how far we can go with simple model and a Bayesian model uh, to be more specific. And once we start, uh, you know, defining the key success or the, the key metrics that we're gonna use to measure success here, we see how far we can go with that. If we don't get the kind of result that we're expecting from the users, then we can, you know, start implementing more sophisticated model or examples of models. And potentially the last option in the menu for us is actually going to deep learning model, because if we can get that kind of efficiency or that kind of accuracy or whatever the metric we pick uh, with more simpler, with more simple uh, algorithms, uh, that's definitely the one uh, option that we wanna recommend. Finally, uh, once we train the model and work with the synthetic data, uh, the next point was to uh, make sure that we can actually host this model and endpoint. And we use uh, an API with the plumber package in R that uh, my colleague Jan is gonna explain exactly how can we actually how do how we actually put this together uh, to make sure that uh, 
you know, the model and the different versions of the model are always uh, accessible from different environments at FINRA. Um, thank you. As uh, David mentioned, we are using uh, Plumber to, um, in this case, easily convert um, existing R scripts into an API endpoint. It is used to customize the uh, endpoint URLs, the input parameters and output through annotations. So for whoever um, uh, have used uh, similar frameworks uh, in Python, that will be uh, fast or in Java, that will be Jer Jersey. Uh, you know, it is, uh, so this layer will be responsible for um, routing to the correct model version and handle some of the logging and uh, error handling. Uh, as a general um, RESTful API best practice, we use uh, URL versioning in our uh, uh, API and that version along uh, as part of the inputs is then used to uh, retrieve the corresponding model data and its predict functions. So uh, we also uh, rely on the uh, error handling and logging to help with, for example, um, troubleshooting any malformed prediction input data. Um, and those logics are separated from each model's predict logic, uh, prediction logic. Um, we also use uh, PetRack as a dependency management system. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, it's similar to Maven for Java or NPM for Node.js. It helps with making sure our projects are portable across different platforms, like developer, among developers, there may be people using Windows versus Macs, and across local development, uh, development machines and uh, remote deploy servers, like we use Windows and then when we deploy to a uh, Linux server, it may behave differently. So PrepRack helps uh, avoid those type of issues. Uh, it, it also um, uh, helps with isolating dependencies from a, pro a project from others by giving its own private uh, package libraries uh, separated from the share um, our library. Now in terms of uh, fulfilling our organizational um, AppSec um, requirements, uh, the PetRat log file serves as a way to um, list out all the direct and transitive dependencies. This file is then used for um, Black Duck Sense, which is basically a software composition analysis system to identify any uh, vulnerability, uh, vulnerable, vulnerable uh, open source packages. Uh, in addition to that, our um, standard Docker slash ECS setup is used to fulfill other container level app set requirements and also sharing hardware resources with other components. So therefore taking full advantage of our cloud infrastructure. Finally, comparing um, our setup with a uh, typical uh, Python class setup. Uh, as a, you know, as someone with more of a developer background, um, my understanding is that uh, data scientists coming from uh, a, t a statistical background generally prefer ours for modeling and visual visualization capability. While Python uh, is more a general purpose language, which is easier to understand, which has an easier to understand uh, syntax for programmers. And also more production ready frameworks for web services similar to this. And knowing that R is a single threaded language, which means that it may not be the best choice for highly concurrent workload this uh, our solution actually uh, would can leverage uh, potentially leverage our uh, scaling through uh, scaling to multiple docker containers in our case to uh, handle this uh, workload issue and now frank is going to um, explain to you more about the version control portion of our project great thank you very much jan and david
Um, before I, I get into that, uh, let me share with you a, a, another little detail about our adventure. At the very beginning, we asked David, who's our data scientist, what is the ideal tool for you to use in modeling a solution with a prediction function? And he suggested R for a lot of reasons. Uh, don't need to get into it at, at this seminar because it seems like everybody here loves R. So it turns out that at FINRA, uh, we're 100% in the cloud. We're one of the biggest consumers of AWS. Uh, it turns out that uh, deploying R into production is not the common path. Uh, most of the machine learning is done using, using other technologies, including Python and, and other things. Um, so it was going to be uncharted territory for us to do this. And uh, that's, yes. I'm sorry, I was just, I'm gonna give you the five minute warning. Thank you, thank you very much, Wendy. Thanks. I'll be real brief. So, uh, so this was an adventure and uh, there, there weren't a lot of breadcrumbs to follow, which motivated us to share uh, the message that it can be done. <laughs> These are the tools that we use to do it. And by the way, we think that there's some best practice uh, insight that we can share with you. So uh, with that goal in mind, let me share that. So we've got three uh, pieces here. Uh, uh, David was talking about the machine learning part. That's a separate concern. Jan was talking about the infrastructure. That's a separate concern. And then there's the application. What ties them all together is the notion that we have a version identifier, which uniquely tells every one of these components what model we're working with. That is the way the switchboard in the middle that Jan was describing, we implemented with Plumber, uh, knows which model to activate to, to send the communication to. And it also gives a very formal uh, yet flexible mechanism for uh, David to create models and put them into our version control system. Um, the folder names are literally just uh, the version identifier. The application. So the application in this case is a Node.js application. That means JavaScript on the server. Uh, it's Angular on the front end. So it's JavaScript on the front end to technically TypeScript. Uh, the application selects the model that it will use simply by updating a configuration file. That means that when David says, hey, I've got a new better machine learning model out there, we're like, that's awesome, what's the version number? And he tells us, and then we make an update to the configuration file. We don't redeploy source code. We just update a version number. Every one of our environments has the most appropriate version that is for that environment in its configuration file. And we can update that very easily. Um, really briefly, uh, key things to keep in mind, which worked out very well for us in our JSON uh, approach is that we identify not only a version identifier, but also the type of model and, and it and enables us to have very different models. Uh, we just have a name for each one. Uh, and then to fully describe the input vector and the output vector so that it's not only human readable, but machine readable. Our application is able to adjust what message it sends and what it expects back simply by us updating that JSON contract. And because we're using JSON, we're able to use JSON schema, which is an open source tooling that is very, uh, very which, which works really well at finding flaws in the static content of a JSON file. Um, the last thought is uh, because of this approach, uh, not only have we separated the concerns, uh, we've also made it possible because it's REST uh, for any application to use this. And with that, we'll turn it over to a uh, question and answer. Wendy, did, did we make the deadline here? You did, yes. I think we have a minute left for questions. Um, let's see, is there a question for the panelists? I mean, for the speakers? <laughs> Ask us how much fun we have at FINRA. It sounds like you have a lot of fun. We do. <laughs> Maybe that's what the F stands for, fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> it should. It, it, there's, there's a lot of interesting work that's going on there. And, uh, and there's a lot of opportunity to work with interesting people. Uh, Jan and, and David are, are just two of the, the very interesting people at the organization. It's a great place. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm always interested in hearing about how R is used in production. So 
this is some some uh, great informa information and it was kind of interesting how all these four talks uh, really you know meshed well in terms of the um, subject matter so kudos to the organizers <laughs> yeah um, speaking of which uh, I guess it's time